And so sometimes it kind of gets reduced to this phrase, you know, once saved, always saved. And I agree with that statement. Don't get me wrong. That's true. But oftentimes that lacks a lot of substance, which I can really hold on to. And so this series really is looking at the sufficiency of our salvation. We want to see in Christ that we have all that we need for life, eternal life, and godliness. Um, I want to spend this weekend looking at a passage of Scripture, which is a great encouragement to me, and Lord willing will be an encouragement to you. Um, and that comes from the book of Second Peter. And so if you do have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the book of Second Peter? And our focus for the three messages that I've prepared for this morning, for adult Sunday school tomorrow morning, and for the morning service are really drawn from First Peter chap- sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And if you wanted a, a, a title for the series, it is uh, Divine Resources for Godly Living. Uh, Divine Resources for Godly Living. Uh, the title of each sermon, however, is slightly different, and that just happens by, as you prepare and, and work things out, as as we consider the, the richness, I guess you could say, of our salvation in Christ Jesus and the blessings that are available to us as believers that I think oftentimes, and I know for my own self, we, we don't realize all that we have in Christ Jesus, which is at our disposal. Uh, there have been stories, for example, in history of You know, men and people who have owned large portions of land, thinking that it was worthless or useless, um, not realizing the value that lay underneath as, you know, oil or gold has been discovered underneath the surface. And all of a sudden they realize that they're multi, multi millionaires because they're sitting on a gold mine or an oil field and they never appropriated all that was there for them. Uh, They never drilled down and discovered that there was a richness to what was already theirs. And I think in the Christian life, we have a temptation to assume that our salvation, or maybe we would call it our justification, is something that happens in the past and and that there's an eternal reward, heaven, but in between we kind of think that we're doing all of this on our own. Or there's, there's not an ongoing ministry that is there in Christ Jesus that is ours for the taking to appropriate, to live a, a godly life, a blessed life, a rich life, a life that is grounded in the assurance of Christ's love for me which then brings out godliness in my life so that I am a blessing to others and I live the life that God intended me to live. And, and so I know that's always been a struggle for me and 2 Peter chapter 1 is always a passage which I go to to remind myself. And really, if you kind of want to think of the, the theme or the crux of this passage, which is right in the middle, it's, it's there in verse 3, which he says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to glory or by glory and virtue by which you have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That, that really forms, I think, the foundation of the series that we're going to look, for, look through. But this morning, I want to backtrack there to verse 1 and talk about the sufficiency of saving faith. The sufficiency of saving faith. Because as you track with Peter in these opening verses of, two, of, of his second book, his, his last book, by the way, he, is, he knows that he is about to be killed. 
He knows his life on this earth is almost finished. He knows that his uh, time to minister to those who God has given him to minister is almost done. Uh, he, He even says there in verse 12, I will not be negligent to remind you of these things, though you know and are established, yet I I think it is right as long as I as I am in this tent. That's not he's not camping; it's his body, uh, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. These are Peter's last words, written to a specific group of people, and he names them in verse one to those who have obtained like precious faith. This is what I want you to know. And so this morning, my title is The Sufficiency of Saving Faith. Let's pray, and we'll commit this time to the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning, and I want to thank you so much for your grace. I want to thank you, Lord, that it has been given and extended to everyone here, for those who profess and confess the name of Christ, who possess him as their Savior. We thank you for this gathering this weekend and pray that above all things, Christ would be magnified through the preaching, through the singing, through the fellowship, through the fun even that we have, that Christ would be everything to us. And as we look at this matter of saving faith, may it, as we understand it deeper, may it bring a great sense of assurance to our soul that in Christ, in the whole gamut of salvation, we have all that we need for life and for godliness. So we commit all these things to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do I have what it takes to live the Christian life? To live a life that is honoring to God? Or am I missing something? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that question. Maybe you look around at people around you and it appears like they have something that you don't have. A a deeper Christian life, a stronger faith, some deeper connection to God that just seems elusive to you, uh, an ability to conquer sin that you don't have. And that question or those doubts are very real for the life of many Christians, and I I would add myself to that list. You kind of read church history, and you read about figures in the past, and you think to yourself, man, if, if that is the Christian life, and I'm looking at my life, Did I miss out on something? Did they get something that I didn't get? Maybe I need something more. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Don't get me wrong. There is something wrong with all of us. But maybe there's something extra wrong with me that is stopping me or hindering me from living out the life that I see the Bible says I'm supposed to live or that it appears that everybody else is living around me. These often thoughts can plague the mind of the Christian and cause us to live in a great sense of doubt, frustration, fear, and sometimes even leads people to either walk away from the faith altogether because they say, well, it's just too hard and I can't live up to the the life that I know I'm supposed to live, or they become disillusioned, They check out. Maybe they still attend church, but they don't really become fruitful in their life. This is a really real issue, I think, for a lot of us, and myself included. And it's actually mentioned in this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, because Peter actually says to us that if we don't understand all that is given to us in Christ Jesus and appropriate that which is given to us, He says the result of this is in verse 9. He says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, my brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do not 
do these things, or if, if you do these things, you will never stumble. And an entrance will be given to you and supplied abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter says there's a, there's a blessing that comes from knowing what is yours in Christ Jesus. If you forget these things, if you neglect these things, you become barren, uh, wasteful, useless, unfruitful in the kingdom of God. Sometimes this idea that we don't have what it takes or need something more has led churches and Christians to go seeking for this extra thing that they think is going to make them who they know they should be. They seek things like some sort of second blessing or read some book which is launching us into some higher Christian plane where we can kind of elevate above uh, the world and, and not be affected by the things that are around us or there's movements that have come along and, and, and teachers that have come along promising a certain prayer to pray or a, a thing to do or a, 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 an experience to have that will kind of accelerate you in your Christian growth and, and make that great leap forward, if you would, so I can live the life that I'm supposed to live. And there are many people who go seeking after these lifestyles and these books and these teachers. As a matter of fact, 2 Peter is often, most of the rest of the book is about identifying false teachers, knowing what they do and knowing what they're like so that we can avoid them. Rather than understanding the basic Christian life or the totality of the gospel, which includes justification, sanctification, and then eventually glorification. And that all of us, if we are trusting in Christ alone, have what we need to live the life that God calls us to live. But there are many believers who do struggle with this idea, what we would call of assurance of salvation. Do I have everything in Christ that I need? And and I think sometimes, and I know I grew up in a church culture which kind of alluded to the idea of my assurance of salvation is kind of reduced to this idea that I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But that's kind of all it was. It was like I've got my ticket to heaven, so I know that if I die, I'm going to go. But there was really no understanding of what it meant for me to have an assurance of faith and the implications for me in a day-to-day -day life. And so sometimes it kind of gets reduced to this phrase, you know, once saved, always saved, and I agree with that statement, don't get me wrong, that's true, but oftentimes that lacks a lot of substance which I can really hold on to, and so this series really is looking at the sufficiency of our salvation. We want to see in Christ that we have all that we need for life, eternal life, and godliness. And that this gospel, which includes justification, sanctification, and glorification, is sufficient because everything is given to us in Christ. Paul, Peter says, sorry, that Christians are to make their calling and election sure. Verse 10, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. In other words, be diligent to Seek assurance. Be diligent to appropriate and get that assurance of your salvation. This is not some sort of legalistic uh, effort that we do in the sense of pretending that we're a Christian because we've kind of done certain things that make us appear to Christians to kind of give us a false sense of assurance. But be diligent, Christian, to seek this blessed assurance that we just sung about, that Jesus is mine to know that Christ is yours and you are Christ because this will lead you to a fruitful and faithful Christian life. So let us begin. Yes, that was my introduction. I warned you, okay? Uh, the sufficiency of saving faith. Verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. This is who Peter's writing to. Faith is essential for the Christian, but without faith it is impossible to please him. 
Hebrews 11.6. The just or the righteous shall live by his or her faith. Romans 1.17. For by grace are you saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. Faith is essential. Um, faith is, is, is what separates the, the saved and the unsaved. Salvation is by grace through faith, but we must understand there are different kinds of faith. In other words, faith in its simplest definition is simply trust or belief, but many people have faith. Actually, I would say everybody in the world has some degree of faith. They all believe something. They all trust in something. Even the atheist has faith. They believe in what they cannot see or have not seen. They believe in what they have heard. They believe in what they have read, and they stake their life upon those things. So everybody has faith. There's different types of faith. For example, the, the heretics that are going to be listed in 2 Peter have a false faith. Okay? Their faith is not saving faith. It's, it's completely fraudulent. It is not in Christ alone, and it leads to and is based upon heretical beliefs which do not bring salvation, but rather damnation. And they are espousing those beliefs, trying to get people to trust in what they say, and there are all kinds of things that, that bring people to a false faith, which leads to damnation. Uh, the hypocrite also, for example, has a, has a feigned faith. Uh, it's a fake faith. It's a faith which appears to be genuine. It's a faith which appears to be Christian, but they don't have a genuine faith, and it eventually reveals, is revealed in their life to be all a show and all a sham. They've put on a facade. They've tried to nail Christian fruits to their life without there being a genuine trust and, trust and, and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've become a hypocrite. And then there's a fruitless faith. Similar to the hypocrite, there's many who profess genuine faith in Christ, but there is no evidence or fruit to their life to demonstrate otherwise. So in order to have a sense of assurance, we need an understanding of what saving faith really is. And when we understand the origin, the nature, and the sufficiency of saving faith, this begins our growth as a Christian. Why do I say that? Well, because in verse uh, uh, 5, when he begins to talk about the things that are the fruits of saving faith, he says, give all diligence, add to your faith. So faith is the foundation. Faith is the, the seed, if you would, that goes into the soil, which then springs up out of that the, the tree or the fruits of, of, of real genuine faith in Christ. Faith is the beginning. We all start by faith. We, we, we uh, trust in Christ. We uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, as the Bible says. It's the beginning, if you would, of the Christian life. But look at verse 1. He says, to those who have obtained like precious faith, Christian, again, describes the Christian as someone who has, sorry, Peter describes the Christian as one who has received faith, which results in salvation. Um, so what do we see about saving faith? I've got three points this morning. First of all, saving faith, true faith, is a supernatural faith. All right? Saving faith is a supernatural faith. Now, we've got to understand, with the idea of faith, faith can be both a noun and a verb. All right? And, and uh, so usually when we use the verb form of faith, we translate it the word believe. Right? That is faith in action. So in order to believe, however, on something, I must have something upon which I can believe. There must be something present in me which enables me then to actually place my faith or trust or cry out or depend upon something else. And he says here, look at how he describes the Christian. And this is fascinating. He says it's to those who have obtained like precious faith. So when I say saving faith is a supernatural faith, what do I mean by that? I mean that true saving faith, faith that cries out, trusts in Christ alone and in his righteousness. 
the Bible describes as something that is actually obtained or received. Now, we often, again, think of faith as something we do, and there is an element to that which is true. We are called to believe. We are called to place our faith in. But here he says, you have obtained saving faith. It's come to you. The Bible says faith comes, how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I say supernatural faith, what I simply mean is that saving faith does not originate solely in the heart of you and I. This idea of obtain, it's in the passive voice, which I know maybe we're stretching our uh, grammar here, but, you know, when we think of active voice, the subject is doing the action. Passive, the subject is receiving the action. He says saving faith is given to you. It's It's a gift given to us by God. The word translated obtained literally means given by divine allotment or to gain by divine will. So, yes, we exercise faith in Christ, but the the power or the ability to do so comes from God. Why? He says it's his divine power. Verse 3, that has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All of salvation is a gift from God. All of salvation is a blessed gift that God gives to his people. It is everything comes from him. Saving faith is exercised, yes, by us, but it does not originate with me. It is a a work of grace that God gives to us. And how does it come to us? Well, we've already said it comes through the word of God, but here specifically he says it also comes through the knowledge of God. Faith comes to us. In other words, what springs up in our heart to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is when the knowledge of God is brought into us by the word of God and that springs up something inside of us so that we are able to believe upon him. And so saving faith comes from God. It must have, of course, the right object. Faith alone is only saving faith if it is in Christ alone. And the Christ alone upon which we trust must be the Christ of the scriptures alone. There are many Christs out there, aren't there? There's lots of Jesuses out there that everybody's preaching. There's political Jesus. There's social justice Jesus. There's uh, rainbow Jesus. There's, uh, um, you know, legalistic Jesus. There's religious Jesus. There's teacher Jesus. There's all sorts of Jesuses out there. And many people are trusting in a false Jesus because they haven't got the knowledge of God through the word of God. And you are blessed, I know, to be in a church where your pastor preaches the word of God and wants to impart to you the knowledge of God. Why? So that faith can be brought into your life, so that God's grace and mercy and love and kindness and righteousness can be imparted to you, and that springs up a love for him in your soul. What great humility, but comfort this should bring to our hearts to see that Salvation is a work of God upon our souls. You know, I I firmly believe that if God just simply left us on our own to find him in the dark, on our own, and said, okay, I'm here, you've got to come find me, that no one would find him. Jesus is the Savior who goes and finds the lost sheep and brings him back. The lost sheep doesn't wander around and eventually make his way back into the fold. Jesus goes and finds him and brings him back. And if you are here this morning and you have saving faith, and if you are trusting in Christ alone, it is because God found you. God came for you. God saved you for some reason. And I, and I read the scriptures and I, I see Romans 3. Three, how it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none who is righteous, no, not one, and there's none who seeks him. And I read that and I say, okay, I know I'm, I'm part of the none that doesn't love God, and I know I'm part of the none that is righteous, but I'm also part of the none that wasn't seeking him. Why am I a Christian? Because God sought me. Why did he seek me? I have no idea. I have no idea. And it is the most humbling 
thing to realize that for some reason, God would seek and save the lost. And for some reason, when the word of God was preached, it generated faith in my soul, and I believed. Why me? Why you? I don't know. I really have no idea. Saving faith is a supernatural faith. Saving faith is also the same faith. Now, you look at Peter. He says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. All right, so you could translate that as well, faith of the same value as us. Well, who's the us? Well, it's obviously inclusive of Peter. Who's Peter? He's one of the apostles. Not only is he one of the apostles, he's like the, the, the top of the apostles, right? And you have Jesus, and he has his 12. Out of his 12, he has his three, Peter, James, and John, who are with him in some of those most intimate moments. And yet, even out of those three, Peter is kind of like the first amongst equals, if you would. I mean, Peter's there at the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's there in the Garden of Gethsemane, sleeping, but he's there. Peter's on the water, walking with Jesus. I mean, people give Peter a hard time, but he's the one who got out of the boat, right? Peter saw the resurrected Christ. Peter was there in the upper room. And this is what's fascinating. He says, your faith is of the same value as mine and us, the apostles and all those who have trusted in Christ. It's of the same in kind. It's of the same value. And it has the same effect as the faith of the apostles. And this is a remarkable statement to the same, the same faith which the apostles had is the same what you have in Melton, Victoria, 2,000 years later. It's the same value. It has the same impact. It has the same result. It's in the same person. God is no respecter of persons. Here's the apostles, and yes, they had a different calling and a different gifting and a different role to play in redemptive history, and God enabled them to do things which you and I don't have the ability to do for a specific purpose and a specific time for a specific reason, but the faith is the same. So you, who has trusted in Christ, has the exact same faith as the apostle Peter, who literally saw Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> What do I mean by it's the same? It's the same origin, Matthew 16, 17. You remember when Peter was asked by Jesus who he was, and Jesus, Peter confesses Christ. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the confession of a Christian, right? Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And what does, God, what does Jesus say to him? He says to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. It's the same origin. The only reason Peter could confess the Lord Jesus is because God revealed that truth to him. Jesus did plenty of miracles, and many people saw them, but didn't confess him as Christ and Lord. So God shows no partiality in salvation. The apostles were given different callings, but their salvation is on equal terms. Not only that, but our faith is the same, and that the same, it's the same origin. It's in the same object. The apostles, who are they trusting? They were trusting Christ alone. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 11 to, to uh, 13, he says this uh, in Ephesians 1. He says, in him we, this is of course the Apostle Paul speaking, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, Christ, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul echoes Peter's words here and says, yes, we trusted in Christ. The apostles trusted in Christ. And after we trusted, you trusted. And you've been given the same inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. 
It's the same object. Our, our faith is the same. It also produces the same outcome. We receive all the blessings and inheritance in Christ as the apostles do. And as remember, you remember the apostles, they're all arguing and they're uh, on, on earth with Jesus, you know, and John comes and, and uh, James, uh, you know, come and, and they're arguing. They want to know uh, who, who's going to be first in the kingdom of heaven. You know, who, who's going to sit at your right hand? Who's, who, who, who's going to be uh, the, in the exalted position? And Jesus rebukes them. There's no partiality. You know, one of the marks of false teachers is that they teach or give you the impression anyway that they have some kind of super faith, something supernatural that you as mere mortals cannot have, well, unless you pay them, of course, to get what they have or follow their teachings or commit yourself to their lifestyle. No, no, su saving faith was sufficient for the apostles and that faith is the same. Lastly, saving faith is a secure faith. He says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is saving faith secure? It is based upon the righteousness of God, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the two titles describing the same person. Jesus Christ is both referred to as our God and our Savior. You know why true salvation is so secure is, it, is because it is not built or based upon your own or my own righteousness. My trust is not in my righteousness. It is based upon and given to me by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, by the one who is truly faithful, by the one who will never change by the one who will never go back on his word, by the one who cannot lie. You see, faith is only as strong as the object on which it is on. So, for example, where I'm originally from in the United States, in Seattle, or Northwest area, every year um, it would snow, and where I lived in one of the places we lived, it was kind of a wooded area and there's these little lakes um, that would freeze over every winter and my brother and I would often go down to these lakes and we'd take rocks and we would throw them out into the lake and you'd see if it would the rock would break through the ice and uh, and sometimes you would throw a rock and it would just go boom right through the ice so it's a very thin sheet of ice sometimes you'd throw a rock and it would just bounce you know you could tell the ice was a lot thicker and then we would be stupid and, and try to walk out on the ice, okay? And you'd start to walk, and you'd go a bit further, and you'd go a bit further, and all of a sudden you hear it, you know, and whoop, and you'd, and, you'd, and you'd pull back. Now, you think about a lake that is frozen over, and it's, you know, a thin sheet of ice. Well, you can have great faith, great confidence, and boldly walk out on that lake, and it doesn't matter how great your faith is, you're going down. Or you could walk out on a lake which is frozen this deep, and you could be timid and fearful and trepid and scared, but that ice will hold you. Because it's not the strength or the confidence that is in you that makes you safe and secure. It is that which you are placing your faith in. You see, the hypocrite trusts in his own righteousness. The hypocrite and the man who has, the woman who has false faith depends upon their own performance to guarantee them a degree of assurance or security and salvation. But the Christian understands that we are made righteous because Christ's righteousness is given to us. And we are rendered before God as acceptable to him. He clothes us with his righteousness. Salvation is a gift of God in all points, which is why it is so secure. Both the faith that he imparts to us through the hearing of his word, through the knowledge of his son, and the righteousness that is needed to satisfy God 
are given to us in Jesus Christ. It is that perfect righteousness which fulfills the law of God that satisfies his wrath for us, which covers us and makes us acceptable in God's sight. And because our faith rests upon that, that which cannot be shaken, that which is secure, you and I can have confidence and assurance that our faith is safe. Saving faith is the foundation of the Christian life. If you are here this morning and you do not have faith in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, if you are trusting in anything or anyone else or seeking to add anything of your own merit, of your own righteousness to your faith, Repent, trust in Christ and him alone. You know, Jesus illustrated best that there is a faith that saves and there's a faith that doesn't in his parable of the sower and the seeds. You know, there's four soils, aren't there? There's one where the seed just falls on the wayside. It doesn't even penetrate into the ground and it withers away and dies. There's another seed that falls into the soil and it begins to spring up. There seems to be evidence of new life. And the sun beats down on it, trials come, and it evidence that that faith wasn't a fruitful faith. Another seed falls in the ground, it begins to spring up, and the temptations and the cares of the world surround that, that little plant, and it chokes it out, and it dies and falls away. And then lastly, there's a f- seed that falls into fertile soil, and it brings life that is fruitful and evident. And we're going to see in the rest of Second Peter what is it that we have in Christ that enables a life to be fruitful to God. And it must be connected to the person of Jesus Christ. If your faith is not connected solely to the person of Christ, you can try. It's like It's like an apple tree that is not producing any apples. It's dead. But you go along and take a bucket of apples and try to staple them to the tree to show that, try to give a fake impression that there's life here. And it may be okay for a while. People may walk by and think, oh, that tree's got apples on it. It must be a fruitful tree. But eventually, because those apples are not connected to the vine, they're going to wither away and die. And it will demonstrate It was a false faith. We're going to see in the next two messages the resources of saving faith and eventually the fruit of saving faith. What does God bring out in our life? But in our conclusion, I want to challenge us and encourage us both to consider where our faith is placed, where does it lie, but encourage you that if there is saving faith in your life, that it is secure because it is God-given, because it is in Christ alone, and that he will fulfill all that he has promised to you. And this ought to bring a great sense of assurance to us because it's from that that we begin to then look at what do we have in the Lord Jesus that is mine to appropriate and to live and to take so that I may live a life that is fruitful and abounding to the glory of God.